Well, welcome everybody to um, this call. And my name is Rachel Schwamm. I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Human Ecology and acting director of the Rutgers Energy Institute. And on behalf of the National Academies Committee to advise the US Global Change Research Program, I welcome you to this listening session on global change issues with a specific focus on energy-related challenges and opportunities. Through USGCRP, federal agencies coordinate climate and global change research and use results uh, to create tools and assessments to help people make decisions in the context of global changes. Through this session and others in this five-part series, we aim to connect more directly with users and researchers who are building on and applying global change information and tools in their work and to gather insights and information that the USGCRP can consider as it plans the implementation of its work over the coming decade. In these sessions, we are welcoming staff from the USGCRP and agencies that compromise it, members of the National Academies Committee to advise the USGCRP, of which I am a member, and all of you who are users and researchers who are engaged in building on and applying the types of knowledge and tools that the USGCRP is charged with developing and supporting. Um, can we start the slides? So in today's session, we have a series of speakers who will provide remarks, all of whom expressed interest in contributing when registering for this session. Everyone here will have opportunities to contribute through an engagement platform that we will introduce shortly. Representatives from the USGCRP and the committee to advise the USGCRP are attending and listening mode today. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you over the next 90 minutes. Next slide. To start, I'd like to acknowledge that while today we are gathered virtually, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nakachtank and Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. We also acknowledge that our understandings of energy and global change issues are closely related to and informed by indigenous knowledge and experience, and that many native communities are on the front line of impacts from these hosts. Today, I am joining from Highlands, New Jersey, the traditional land of the Navasink and Lenape people. Next slide, please. I and, other, and the other members of the committee to advise the USGCRP are looking forward to these sessions to connect directly with researchers and users who are using and applying global change information in their work. As part of our regular meetings throughout the year, we provide this and other opportunities to engage with and hear from broader audiences to inform this important work. The goals of this series and of the series of listening sessions include to gather useful, actionable input for USGCRP to, for implementation of its work, to make connections and expand group of researchers and users who are directly engaging with the USGCRP and its work, to recognize connections across researchers, users, and themes of USGCRP work and products, and inform a potential future engagement mechanisms and opportunities, including forms, approaches, and participants for such engagement. Next slide, please. Today, we are seeking input on how USGCRP may implement its work better to understand and address global change issues. You do not need to be familiar with USGCRP to provide input. We are specifically seeking to connect with a broader audience in these sessions. If you are unfamiliar with USGCRP, we hope you had a chance to view the introduction video on our event page is before the session or encourage you to view it afterwards. 
In preparing for these listening sessions, USGCRP requested input and insights on the following themes to inform the implementation of its strategic priorities and activities. First, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Which actions should be prioritized to fully incorporate these values in research, community engagement, and workforce development? How do we implement them? Second, advancing science. What are the priority gaps and foundational science methods that re require enhanced long-term investments? Third, use-inspired research. How do we ensure that USGCRP science and products are better driven by and connected to users, including, for example, improved use of consultation, collaboration, translation, dissemination, informing climate services, socioeconomic science integration? And finally, socioeconomic sciences integration. What are these priorities for integrating socioeconomic sciences into our program and to inform critical decisions? Particularly helpful feedback might include ideas on emerging large-scale scientific questions related to global change and or response, especially those where interagency collaboration will be critical. Specific information on how science is or is not being used to inform societal response to global change and why, and knowledge gaps and obstacles to implementing scientific tools or knowledge. The USGCRP is developing its next decadal strategic plan and expects to release a draft prospectus with a public comment opportunity before the end of 2021. While these lessening sessions might help inform the development or implementation of this plan, Individual feedback on the prospectus should be submitted through the public comment mechanism. To ensure we all have time to speak today, we will be holding you to the five minute limit. Next slide. In this session, we are uh, committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identity-based factors. Please report misconduct immediately to Steven Stichter. S, um, hopefully it's there on the, yes, it's there on the slide. And I'll turn this back to uh, Steven for further discussion. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Rachel, and welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Um, next slide, please, Mandy. I am um, here to talk about some logistics and um, want to first go over Zoom. We're all, everyone who is here has successfully joined the Zoom platform and we're happy to, happy to see you here. Uh, we encourage you to set your screen to speaker view. We will have a series of speakers who are talking um, throughout this session, um, providing oral comments they've signed up for. <clears throat> to provide oral comments to this session. Um, and at the same time, we have available a platform, Slido, to capture key points from the speakers and contributions from all of you. Um, most of the interaction from all of you will be through the Slido platform, which I will discuss next. If you have any issues with either this Zoom platform or Slido, please send a chat uh, to the host via the Zoom or an email to Rob Greenway, um, whose, uh, whose email is listed on the slide. Um, we encourage you to uh, update your name to have your full name and affiliation within the Zoom platform. And um, today we have a series of speakers who will provide oral remarks on the theme of global change and energy. Uh, the first set of speakers were were the first ones to indicate during registration an interest in providing oral remarks. These speakers will all appear with video. Time remaining, we will draw additional speakers from the wait list and from the broader audience that's joined us today, all of you. Um, any such uh, speakers will be audio only. Um, we also have closed captioning uh, available throughout the session. The transcript is available through the live transcript icon in the Zoom menu bar. And um, so please please access that, uh, that resource if you are interested or need that. Uh, next slide, please. So we, um, as I noted, in addition to the Zoom 
video and audio contributions, we will we are running the Slido engagement platform. Um, Slido allows you to interact with to provide comments and interact with comments of other participants. Um, there are a number of ways that you can join Slido. Um, one is through this QR code, or you can go to slido.com and enter the event code that's listed on the screen, 219036. In addition, uh, if you look in the chat, there'll be a link for joining Slido directly in the chat. Um, we have, um, within Slido, we'll be using the Q&A mode. It's a little, uh, we're not using it exactly as designed. So we're actually looking for insights, recommendations, opportunities, gaps, and challenges that you have to contribute around this theme of global change and energy. Um, so even though we're using Q&A, we're looking for thoughts and statements and recommendations rather than questions. Um, as noted previously, the uh, USGCRP and the committee are here in listening mode, so we won't be specifically addressing questions um, that are raised either in the oral comments or in the Slido platform. Um, there is, just to note, a 300 character limit on entries. Um, and so if you have longer entries, you can enter a start a thread or reply to an existing thread um, and then add additional comments through the reply. Um, so again, start by hitting the ask button, even though we're asking you to provide uh, comments and, and thoughts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just what you will see when you are signing in. Uh, it'll ask for your name and email address, um, and then you select join event. Next slide, please. And then um, once, once you're on, whether it's mobile or on the web, um, you'll see a sign that says, ask the speaker. But again, it's in that box, type your question is where we ask you to give your contributions. Um, next slide, please. So finally, uh, uh, some disclaimers that we have, we are recording this, uh, this event and um, that it's part of the information that is provided to USGCRP as they consider your remarks and, and contributions going forward. Um, so all remarks and, and contributions both here and on Slido will be uh, part of the public record for this event. Additionally, we've invited speakers and um, they are coming on as individuals. They, they may be associated with um, affiliated with organizations, but we've asked them to speak uh, from their own behalf. Um, so thanks again for joining us. And at this point, I'd like to, I'd like to invite Mike Cooperberg to provide a welcome on behalf of USGCRP. Great. Stephen, thank you very much. Um, I'm told by my computer that I can't start my video. Ah, yes, I can. Thank you so much. I'm Mike Cooperberg. I am the executive director of the US Global Change Research Program. We call it USGCRP. USGCRP is managed by the Subcommittee on Global Change Research, which consists of representatives from the 13 federal agencies that make up the program. You can think of that subcommittee as the board of directors for USGCRP. I'm here today representing those 13 agencies and we want you to know that we are serious about our legislative mandate to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. On behalf of USGCRP, thank you for your interest, for your time, and for your expertise. Your input will be heard and considered as we draft and implement a new 10-year strategic plan for USGCRP. In addition to the staff from the National Academies, there are a number of federal agency representatives and representatives from the USGCRP National Coordination Office here today. They will be listening carefully, taking notes to inform our discussions and writing for this new plan. The new plan will be completed next year. Between now and then, you can expect to see a prospectus, that is a, a high-level annotated outline of the plan coming out for public comment, um, I hope, in November and a full draft of the plan, which will be released for public comment and also for review by the National Academies in the middle of 2022. Please watch for these opportunities and please feel free to comment 
both on the prospectus and on the draft plan. Finally, on behalf of USGCRP, our sincere thanks to you for taking the time to speak to us today, to the committee to advise USGCRP and the staff of the National Academies for organizing these listening sessions. Specifically, I wanna thank Rachel Schwarm, Steve Stickner, Amanda Stout, and Amanda Purcell from the committee and the National Academies, respectively. And my sincere thanks to Katie Reeves and Julie Morris from the National Coordination Office here at USGCRP for their roles in making this possible. We very much look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. Rachel, back to you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to hear from our first speaker, um, Ayadi Mishra. Please join us to speak. Hi. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, hi, I am an architecture student from SPA Bhopal, that's in India, and I am part of the UNEP MGCY as a constituency member, and I am uh, a secretary of the Yongo, which is again the official constituency for young people in UNFCCC. So I'll start with what concerns me the most, which is again, young people's involvement. So individual scientists' commitments can lead to great discoveries and for sustainable learning too, but they still, when working across disciplines, must nevertheless rely on some key aspects of existing academic cultures, or just to maintain their authority and status. All these sanctions make moving out of one's profession quite hard. And again, it's practically difficult not to mention the academic jargon and bureaucracies that come and itself becomes jargon. It is still hard for a young person to be involved in discussing their own future. So the point here that I'm trying to make is we need more equity across the people and also the research they do. What I have seen is um, the research work that focuses on something fundamental be favored and become to a more immediate concern to policymakers. The ingredients that seem to do so are the ones that consider topics that either have high impact or have uh, multiple stakeholders or affect the robustness of societies as we know under the impact of the global environmental changes or are likely to become more important over an immediate time scale. These again affect the capacity of a certain sector or may have irreversible effects in the global environment or on people's ability to respond. So I am quite grateful for the work and opportunities that USGCRP offers, but as we all know, it, it, it is only taking those few steps that we again need to move to a larger goal. So it's, it's not just uh, the idea that the indirect conceptual impact that is usually seen as influencing the policymakers' thinking, but in long term, it reaches to the instrumental impact, which again, the tools that people are making and whatever we use is mainly in this youth population. As I come from India, this becomes even stronger for me. So in the end, I'll just say that we need more resources. We need more platforms for the impact that we, the youth, want to make. And we need more of those platforms, not only on international levels, but also on local grassroots levels, because the more the voices they are, the more we move towards that same goal that we all have after the COP26. And the ones that are gonna leave as in, and just gonna lead us together are gonna then decide what impacts this future. So people, power and climate justice, that's my message. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ayadi. I'd like to now invite our uh, next speaker, Suzanne Singer. Hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am Suzanne Singer. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation, speaking to you from Northern Arizona, which is home and is of cultural significance to many tribes around the southwestern U.S. I am the executive director of Native Renewables, and I have a background, a PhD in mechanical engineering, and I think sort of my experience growing up, my grandparents living without electricity, uh, running water, um, definitely no internet, and my technical expertise, and then leading to tribal energy research has kind of led me to form a nonprofit organization, um, largely because of the frustration of the lack of energy access for so many indigenous families. 
the Navajo Nation, if you're unfamiliar, is within Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, and I'll focus on that for now, just because that's the community that I'm from. But it's about 27,000 square miles. And there's approximately 15,000 families who still do not have access to grid tied electricity. Um, so a big part of what I work and promote is energy, energy access equity. Um, and it's really a shame if you live like in Nevada, Las Vegas, Phoenix, you have benefited from natural resources that come from tribal lands and you have gotten electricity because of what um, in companies have been able to do and export the power. So it's just a really shame the inequity that exists that others can have power because of the resources yet we're still struggling to power our own family homes. Um, so I think some of the things I want to share or promote and I think ask for in regards to future projects, programs, um, research. So one is always advocating for equitable goals in being inclusive of both Indigenous communities and rural communities. Um, within Indigenous communities, you may be familiar with um, informed consent. So that's a really critical process of which I personally think includes educating community members on um, the technology that's going to be proposed within a community or the technology that it is going to be used for research purposes. Um, so that's really critical. I think being transparent about those processes. Um, I've seen a lot of energy projects not go through and a lot of research efforts not happen because not all community not all community members felt like they were informed or that information was not shared with them or distributed widely and it was only shared with a small group. Another thing I'll sort of ask um, as you're doing the work that you do is really think about the whole life cycle process of an effort, a project. Um, I think thinking about decommissioning, land use, um, indigenous, a lot of indigenous people thinking of themselves as caretakers of the land. We don't own land, but we are caretakers of it. And so in terms of energy disposal efforts, I think thinking about how that could impact um, the cultural values of community members who maybe rely on um, the plant life that's in the area or they use those land areas for gatherings. And so just thinking about the impacts that any effort projects, future projects could have um, I would encourage you to think about that as well and be transparent about it. Um, another point I like to share is investment in on the ground organizations is really important. Um, I think a lot of the folks that I work with, they are from the communities they're in, they've been there for years, they know the issues, they know the families and you know they, be, they know what's not gonna fly in terms of getting work done there and they understand the barriers. So I think being, um, make sure, making sure you're valuing that community knowledge, that cultural knowledge that a lot of times can go hand in hand with science as well. And some other things I think is if you are wanting to work within indigenous communities, thinking about what makes good partnerships. Um, I think engaging in leadership in the communities, uh, being open to collaboration, but also bring ideas. If you have that technical expertise and that community does not, um, they might struggle a little bit to come up with some ideas. So I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for your comments. I'd like to invite Trisha Youngball now to speak. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I am Trisha Youngbull, as mentioned, from the MITRE Corporation, which is a nonprofit that was founded 63 years ago um, that operates seven FFRDCs. And I'm part of MITRE Labs Energy and Environmental Sciences Group. So I will comment on the topics of social equity and energy resiliency in civilian and military use inspired research um, to assist in the energy transition. So what is really needed, you know, is the deployment of the good research and tools um, that's being done by us scientists into user accessible formats um, that can be put in the hands of practitioners and decision makers to help them bridge knowledge gaps and build consensus on 
their energy transition plans. So as I'm sure you all know, the US needs to rapidly decarbonize its energy production to mitigate climate change. And the good news is that there are many existing technologies to produce carbon-free electricity at scale, and there are lots of feasible plans to do so. Um, but the challenging part is making this transition equitable and as painless as possible, uh, producing that lasting community value that the last speaker touched on um, from these new infrastructure investments. Um, that can be in the way of new green jobs, clean air, and more reliable power, and helping to build that infrastructure that is more resilient to climate impacts. So as many of you know, underserved communities experience many injustices, including energy insecurity, both from the cost of their electricity, to living in places more vulnerable to floods and fires, to having a polluting power plant in their backyard, directly impacting community health. You know, confound this with coal plant closures, leaving workers without new energy jobs and high unemployment caused by the pandemic. So what is MITRE doing to help with the energy transition? Um, we have spent the past year building several tools and capabilities to assist those local, state, federal, and tribal governments with their energy transition and resiliency goals. You know, one issue delaying the creation of new clean energy jobs is the placement of the new power plants, which is hindered by the difficulty of creating that stakeholder consensus um, and the risk of not having the available workforce to build and operate the new facilities. So after a year of work, we've nearly finished building a tool um, uh, that's geograph that includes geographical data and modeling to allow local governments to plan and site these new power plant investments. Um, it compiles many federal data sources, has an economic impact model, and big data labor analytics to facilitate the decisions at the community level and therefore help build that consensus. Um, we're also building capabilities to assess threats and vulnerabilities. Um, you know, those be cyber, physical, or climate events of both military and civilian energy resources. And lastly, we're in the process of building a social equity and distributional impact analysis framework for federal and state agencies to use when doing benefit cost analysis of their energy projects. And so, you know, there are a lot of different stakeholders um, convening around the energy transition. So again, creating um, tools that are accessible that can be used across uh, that decision space um, is necessary to help make the transition equitable and as painless as possible. That's all I have. Thank you, Tricia, for your comments. You're welcome. Um, so I just wanted to jump in really quickly to say that we've had some speakers who um, were unable to, to join us at the last minute. So we will have an opportunity after this initial set of speakers um, has given their remarks uh, for people from the audience to also make contributions. You have the capability in the audience to raise your hand. And if you would uh, raise your hand, then we will, um, we will work through contributions from audience. The audience, uh, those will be audio only, um, but please let us know if you're interested in making uh, contributions. One of the things that we recognize is though we have these sessions um, that are focused on a specific theme, um, so much of this work in, in uh, global change is cross-cutting. And so we actually welcome comments that cut, cross across, cut across any of these themes. Um, so um, I'll pass it back to Rachel to continue with the, uh, with the signed up speakers, um, but we will look for your uh, raised hands uh, for people who are interested in making contributions. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And so next up we have Ronald Larson who will be speaking. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Am I coming through? I, yep. I guess so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the subject uh, that I've worked on for the last roughly 20 years, which is biochar, a form of taking carbon out of the atmosphere 
Before I go into that, let me give a little more of my background. Uh, I, I wrote just the, the, some of my present affiliations. I was in the first class of congressional fellows in 1973. There were nine of us. I was representing the IEEE electrical engineers. I worked on the first solar legislation that established uh, what's now called NRO, but was then called SERI. And I worked uh, for a year after that with the Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, I'm a past chair of the um, uh, ACES, the American Solar Energy Society. Uh, I've worked mostly uh, on stoves after I retired. And I, I, I worked on stoves because I headed a project in Khartoum, Sudan for USAID on all forms of energy, a, a very uh, fine country, I might add. So I'm going to uh, switch to my uh, four entries and I'll just read them. I can't see any other screens, but I'll try to do this quickly. So my first of four points is the DOE often equates RE, renewable energy, to only solar PV and wind. But bioenergy bio is the energy source today for half the world's population, a community sure to be most harmed by global warming. Biochar would be properly recognized if and when DOE better includes bioenergy as RE. Second issue, carbon dioxide removal and national labs. The Department of Energy is lumping biochar with all the other CDR approaches, there are about eight of them, to be handled by NETL, the, the designated DOE lead lab, lead lab for fossil, not renewable, bio, biomass energy. NREL, with world-class expertise in biomass, including biochar, is not being appropriately, uh, appropriately utilized for CDR. I, I was a branch chief. I was in the proposal for today's NRL. I was a branch chief and I was the first uh, fellow or uh, something, I forgot, principal scientist. Third point, carbon negativity and energy. The cost of electricity as a co-product with biochar is obviously more than its cost uh, more than its cost from wind and solar. But the combined cost of one, electricity or fuels, two, dispatchable stores, we're mostly talking about hydrogen these days, and that's not the only option. Three, carbon negativity, that, that is what uh, uh, biochar is mostly listed as, one of the seven or eight CDR options. Number four, food. Biochar going into the ground gives increased NPP. And the fifth point, jobs can be lowest uh, with biochar. I've forgotten what that means, that didn't make sense. Number D is more about biochar. Number one, it's gonna be the least cost in developing countries where the USA should feel continuing CO2 guilt. Number two, Biochar helps much of the U.S. economy, uh, forests, agriculture. I think agriculture is the U.S.'s biggest industry. Urban affairs, blue energy, the coastlines and oceans. Number three, biochar always means local jobs. Uh, many of the technologies cannot provide local jobs. Number four, Biochar is always an investment, it's not a cost, and must not be analyzed like DAX and BEX. Now I'm going back to the screen here. And I hope I'm still being here to open. Got no more time. That's it. Bye bye. Thank you, Ronald. Um, and so now we'd uh, like to open it up for questions if um, folks want to raise. Uh, question, not questions, I guess, comments. Uh, folks want to raise their hand and offer some comments? Um, yes, we, we do have, um, so the next session, I mean, I just got a, a 
request or a query um, in the next session is just audio only. Um, Bob Pilko, if um, can, Rob, can you um, open Bob's audio and see if we can get that to work for him? I think it may be open now. I hit the unmute button. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay, you thank you just... very much. Um, uh, sorry, I couldn't speak via video because of uh, lack of connection and uh, other issues. But uh, here on audio, the reason for wanting to speak is the fact that, that um, geothermal energy in all its forms is something that only recently is being recognized by uh, the investment, the government uh, agencies, and uh, other communities. It's, it's been there for a very long time in the form of legacy geothermal, especially in uh, uh, the West where there's very hot um, uh, spots from the Salton Sea to um, uh, the geysers. Uh, and of course, internationally in the ring of fire. Uh, that's great, um, absolutely wonderful. It's what I call legacy of conventional geothermal where you bring everything to surface. But what I really want to have the DOE, the um, uh, NAS and others uh, within the um, government agency and uh, societal uh, uh, realms to start to focus on geothermal in a closed loop type system where everything stays below ground and in other type reservoirs, which are uh, medium temperature within the range of oil and gas uh, well and drilling capabilities today. And those uh, capabilities are extending rapidly to much higher temperatures, but basically we're talking uh, uh, temperatures in the 300 degree F to um, uh, 500 degree F range. And if one looks at uh, sedimentary basins, uh, they are well spread throughout the US, certainly uh, within oil and gas re regions such as the Gulf Coast of the US other places of the world as well. And the multiple uses of high temperature geothermal energy from direct heat use for um, heating facilities and buildings, uh, communities and um, uh, other uh, surface areas to um, the use for conversion to electricity is something that has been, we'll say, uh, uh, not overlooked, but uh, minimized. And the most important thing about geothermal energy is it's continuous. It is not uh, intermittent like wind and solar. It does not require batteries. Uh, yes, it could be used for subsurface storage. And uh, uh, if one goes deep enough, and with today's technology, it's easy enough to drill deep enough. It's not cheap though. Um, uh, geothermal actually has a much wider uh, geographic footprint than um, uh, originally expected. So more research continually goes into this area, uh, being able to drill and measure to much deeper and hotter depths as well as the initial capital costs coming down. Uh, quite frankly, the surface equipment uh, continues to lower in price and get much more energy efficient, but the subsurface wells portion has a uh, high upfront CapEx cost. And that high upfront CapEx cost the wells again because the new technology continues to drop rapidly. Um, I would like and advocate that uh, NAS, uh, DOE, and the other government agencies um, uh, put more emphasis on geothermal research and uh, uh, geothermal development throughout the US and uh, with US interests 
uh, for all reasons, including energy efficiency, um, uh, uh, equity, of course, and um, national security. Thank you very much. Appreciate the chance to speak. Take care. Thanks very much for those comments. Uh, is there anyone else? I'd like to raise their hand. Um, I've not seen uh, additional interest as, as yet. And I just, you can either raise your hand or send, um, send a, a chat to me with that, with that interest. We'll give just a moment more and um, we'll be happy. Seems we've had a um, series of folks who were not able to uh, to make contributions this morning after signing up. Um, let's just give it a moment to see if there's anybody who's interested. Um, all right. Well, um, then let's see. All right. Well, this is is a shorter session than we than our what we had time scheduled for. But we have it is one of five sessions, and um, we've had robust contributions for the others, and look forward to uh, engagement in the final two, which will be in December. Um, Mandy, can you bring up the the final two slides? Great. So. Um, in follow-up to this and the other sessions, uh, we will be sending an email to all registrants uh, with another opportunity to engage and provide contributions to USDCRP um, through a, a call for input um, is the first questionnaire and then an evaluation for this session as well. Um, after each listening session, we will be posting on the event page, um, which you can find at the National Academy site um, referencing the, this address below or just searching on the National Academy site, uh, some of the outputs from this activity. And you can find the outputs from all of the activities um, at the end of this session, series of sessions. Um, we will provide um, a video recording and transcript of the session, as well as um, we'll provide additional information as, as it comes available. Um, inputs from these listening sessions will be available to USGCRP. They are, they are, we have representatives from USGCRP participating in this, um, in this session um, and the others, um, but we will also be providing the, the recordings and, and other inputs to USGCRP for their work. Um, next slide, please. Um, so today is our third of these listening sessions. We have two more scheduled uh, for the first full week of December. On December 6th in the afternoon, we have a session fo focused on food and global change. And two days later on December 8th, we have a session focused on transportation and infrastructure. Um, so we, we encourage you to join us for any and all of these sessions and please spread the word about, about future sessions as well. Um, so Mike and then Rachel, if you have some closing remarks. Stephen, I just wanted to repeat my thanks. Interesting comments um, and we, we've got a lot of notes. Thank you all very much for your time and your input. It's valued and appreciated. Thanks. Yes, just similarly, as a member of the committee to advise the USGCRP, uh, thank you all for your participation and insightful comments. I learned a lot and was, was happy to hear from you. So thank you. Great. Thanks all for joining.